Welcome to this latest edition of our video interview series here at iConnect. And today my guest is John Marshfield, an assistant professor of law at the University of Arkansas. Today we'll be discussing John's new paper. It's called Decentralizing the Amendment Power, a fascinating piece about subnational constitutional design in connection with the amendment power. John, welcome. Thanks for your time today. No, thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. John, I, uh, I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, congratulations on it, by the way. I see that it's now forthcoming in the Lewis and Clark Law Review, and we will post a link to your paper on iConnect when we publish this interview. But as I was saying, I really enjoyed reading this paper because I find that I learned so much from this uh, paper, uh, probably more than I've learned about subnationalism from any paper since Tom Ginsburg and Eric Posner's paper on subnationalism just a few years ago, published in the Stanford Law Review. So, so thank you for writing this important paper. And I guess I'd like to begin, John, if I can, by asking you to make a connection for us between your earlier work in subnational constitutionalism and constitutional design in connection with South Africa and this particular paper, which expands the field of view from South Africa to include many, many constitutional democracies. Sure. So, I mean, my, my interests uh, really sort of lie in the intersection between subnational political issues and then institutional design. And so, you know, federalism is an obvious example. Federalism can be viewed as a way to accommodate some of these subnational uh, political movements that often appear in societies, and it's a way to sort of institutionalize an arrangement that can accommodate those and, and kind of deal with um, sort of a layered division of power. And South Africa presented, especially during its, its transition, um, I think you could arguably say that some of the uh, sort of subnational issues have diffused a little bit in the years since the transition to democracy from apartheid. But I think definitely during the transition to apartheid, one of the really significant conflicts was uh, the Nkata Freedom Party and the, the Zulu people within the province of KwaZulu-Natal. And so there was a real concern that there might be a secession from South Africa. And so even as apartheid was sort of inevitably coming to an end uh, during the negotiations and everybody saw that that was going to happen, there was a concern that there was this new fear that the Zulu people were really going to stake claim to um, sort of a national identity and require a lot of independence. Um, and I think that, you know, studying that process, there were a lot of really creative constitutional solutions, um, you know, specifically just giving the province of KwaZulu-Natal an opportunity to draft their own constitution. Um, and just giving them that drafting opportunity ended up having a really important effect on consolidating the democracy in South Africa and helping them sort of work through that transition. Um, and so I guess that that's kind of my, that's the South Africa component to that. But as part of that, I'm just I'm generally interested in subnational political movements um, and how institutional arrangements can deal with those kinds of things. Um, and so the amendment power, I guess, was my my next target, right? So to think about how um, amendment power and the amendment rules might be organized and structured to deal with some of the different uh, subnational issues that we see in a variety of, of different societies. So I want to talk uh, a lot more about the ideas in your paper, but if you could. Just summarize for us the takeaway from this paper. Sure. So um, I think the, the takeaway sort of has two branches. Um, the, the first part of it is to really challenge our notions and our thinking about why we might want subnational subnational units or groups. So states, provinces, land or cantons, why might we want an amendment process that gives them a voice? in the amendment of the national constitution. And it's not, in, you know, it's not necessarily obvious that we would want that. Um, and I, I think that there hasn't been a real focused inquiry yet into that. And the, the general notion, which I think is absolutely accurate, but not necessarily a complete picture of the whole situation, is that in federal systems, we need some way to safeguard the federal arrangement. And so we make sure that subnational units have pretty significant voice in the amendment process to ensure that the vertical division of power is not just completely obliterated. And that makes a lot of sense, but what I wanted to do is kind of probe below the surface and maybe even, maybe a good way to describe it is to think about it from the bottom up. So if I'm, if I am a subnational community, I have sort of a, a collective interest in certain issues, um, how, how am I able to get voice in the amendment of the national constitution and why might that be something that the society as a whole wants to accommodate? Um, and so that's the one component of it. I, I try to sort of run through what I think are a few overlooked and important reasons why it might make sense to do this. 
Um, the other aspect of it is I just wanted to get my mind around the way it's actually been done. Um, and so another takeaway is just sort of an empirical review of what's actually in the current amendment rules and constitutions around the world. And so I just kind of went through all the currently operational national constitutions and I looked for how um, subnational units might have a voice in those processes as they currently exist and try to just provide a resource, I guess, um, that kind of lays out, because there's quite a bit of creativity that exists in the documents we already have. And so I just wanted to kind of put that in a place that might sort of open the door for further thought and investigation on this whole issue. Great. Well, that's going to be our agenda for our discussion today, the things you've just, you've just flagged as important things to discuss. So let's begin then. Why, um, John, might constitutional designers want to give subnational units a voice in the amendment process, apart from safeguarding federalism? Sure. So, you know, I think I'll, there's a few that I think are, are kind of really interesting and maybe not as intuitive. Um, you know, the first relates to the fact that the amendment power inevitably implicates issues of political legitimacy and sovereignty. So uh, an amendment is a change to a society's fundamental law, right? And so there's going to be a constitutional output that changes the fundamental law. And presumably, constitutional designers, when they're constructing these amendment rules, they, they want to maximize opportunities for that output to be legitimate, right? For society to recognize it as a legitimate change to their fundamental law. Um, and so if you, if you can imagine kind of a simplistic uh, society where it's sort of homogenous, territorially consolid consolidated, and everybody is sort of, you know, one national political community, one way to legitimate an amendment in that society might just be to find a process for polling the population. If it's a democratic society and you're dealing with sort of a popular sovereignty conception of legitimacy, you know, you find ways to poll the population to make sure that this change is legitimate. But a lot of societies, as we know, right, their, their legitimacy configuration and the sources of legitimacy in societies are very complicated, and lots of them involve subnational groups who have sort of collective interests, and the national constitution that provides structure for the society as a whole is predicated in a sense, or to a degree, on an endorsement by that collective subnational group, right? And so the amendment rules, if they're really seeking to provide or to maximize legitimacy when they generate their outputs, if those are the environmental factors, there might be a real need to make sure that the amendment rules reflect that and they give voice to these subnational groups so that you don't undermine the legitimacy of the ultimate you know, output. Um, two other ones that I'll mention briefly is I think that we often overlook the fact that of the amendment power, um, and I think Cass Sunstein um, has raised this issue, the amendment power is kind of weird. Because in one sense, it's um, a constituting power, right? So it changes the fundamental law, which is really the, the basic law that's going to kind of govern everything we do and everything that government does. But on the other hand, there's actually procedures and rules that dictate how it's used, right? So it's not just an untethered act, untethered act of sovereignty. It's actually constituted in a way. And if we think about it in that respect, then we, we might be concerned that like any other government power that we set up, and where we sort of explain how we want people to go about exercising that power, we might be concerned that it's misused, right? Like, you know, we might just be concerned that the legislative power might not be used properly. And so we set up checks and balances. And I think the amendment power, if we think about it in that way, you know, maybe we want some checks and balances in who gets to use the amendment power, how it gets exercised. And, you know, those checks and balances, they don't necessarily have to come from decentralization. They might come from... For example, in the Netherlands, um, I, I believe there's a requirement that there's an intervening election. So the, UNA, the um, national legislature is primarily responsible for adopting amendments, but then there's an intervening election, and then the national legislature considers the same amendment again. And the idea there, I think, in part, is that there's a check, right? There's a check on agency problems that might exist between the representatives in the national legislature and what the actual people would want the amendment to be. And I think that decentralization is another way. So if you give subnational groups a voice in this process, you're building into the amendment power a check, right? And so the, it's basically the same design logic that we understand from federalism, but it's you know brought into the amendment process. Um, and then the, the last one, interesting, briefly, is just the idea of from deliberative democracy principles. There's a sense that the more voices we have in a collective decision the more information we might get, the more we're likely to trend towards a substantively better outcome, right? And that's, this is another reason why, if we look around and we see that there are collective interests 
that operate under a subnational or under a national constitution, excuse me, we might really want their perspective. We want, might want their voice because we think it's going to add something to the debate and it's going to help the debate move towards a better substantive outcome. Um, and all of these are things I think that have been really underdeveloped in how we would think about designing um, the amendment process and the amendment rules in a constitution. So those are some of the reasons why designers might want to include, uh, might want to devolve some power to the subnational units uh, in the amendment process. As I was reading your paper, John, um, I picked up uh, Donald Lutz's book on principles of constitutional design, um, and I turned to page 170 in which he ranks um, 36 democratic constitutions in terms of constitutional rigidity. And let me just mention to you the, the first four or five most difficult constitutions to amend according to his methodology. Um, most difficult, United States Constitution. Uh, second most difficult, Venezuelan Constitution. Next, Swiss Constitution. Then the Australian Constitution. Now, all of these uh, are federal states. So is this a, just a coincidence, or is there something um, about federal states that makes formal amendment much more difficult. And of course, keep in mind, some of these constitutions have multiple amendment rules. Some of them are tiered, correct? And so perhaps you can reflect on, on that. This is much more than a coincidence, is it not? I think it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting question um, to, to sort of parse out, because there's a variety of different ways to think about rigidity of amendment to begin with. Um, and so you know, that, that's a sort of a, a threshold question. But I, I think that the general notion that when you're making any sort of collective decision and you add an additional decision maker, right, you're going to end up with a process that usually gives you less options that everybody can agree on. So the more, the more people that need to decide and sign off on this thing, the more our options for a choice that we're all going to like are limited, which means we agree on less things. And you know, if it's the amendment context, then maybe we just are less likely to come to amendments over time. And I think there's something there's something to that that could be sort of part of what's what's going on. Um, you know, federal, an another way to look at it too is that federal arrangements are often the product of really complex societal conditions, right? And so that bearing on the same issue, there could be a variety of competing interests that just make collective decision making at the national level difficult anyway. And so when then when you get to issues of fundamental law, the stakes are even higher and that might be affecting it. Um, but yeah, so there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to think on that. I, I don't know that it's a coincidence but I, I certainly don't think I could probably identify any particular causal factor that's driving that, but it's fascinating to think about. So we've talked about some of the reasons why designers might want to devolve some power to subnational units in constitutional amendment. Um, and here now, in asking about the Lutz, um, the Lutz empirical study, I wanted to gesture toward the second part of the question, which is some of the reasons why designers might not want to devolve some powers to the subnational units in uh, informal amendment, one of which might be that it just makes it more difficult. Are there any other reasons that you've encountered in your in your research in this particular paper as to why designers might hesitate to devolve some power to subnational units? Sure. So you know, rigidity is a, is a real problem, and you know that there's there's that concern, and and there's a lot of growing research that suggests that. Rigidity has significant impact on whether a constitution actually endures, right? And, and that's so the, the stakes there are high, and you've already pointed that out. Um, another one I think relates to the legitimacy point. So the inverse of promoting legitimacy by giving subnational groups a voice in the process is that sometimes, right, if, if subnational units have too great a voice, you end up sort of providing them with these veto rights that really trump what the rest of society really wants in their fundamental law. And you know, I think that there's, there's instances in the United States um, and in Australia where this has kind of bubbled to the surface a little bit. The Equal Rights Amendment um, in the United States is an example where you know, people were really confused as to why this didn't get through. Legally, it's because not enough states ratified it, right? But the more polls that were taken over the national population, the more it was seemed to suggest that, at least initially when it was enacted, lots of people really thought this was a good idea and we needed this in our fundamental law. And yet the veto power of the states and a few, a minority of states that were really against it were able to prevent that. And I think a lot of, you know, the, the idea was that this sort of made us question whether this is a legitimate way 
to control the content of our fundamental documents. Um, so yeah, there's there's these legitimacy problems where I think if you have an imbalance in the authority of subnational units, you could start to undermine the process itself. John, one of the contributions that your paper makes um, is that it it suggests a taxonomy. In fact, it presents a taxonomy of the variations on inclusion of subnational units in the amendment process. Could you say a bit about the taxonomy that you've created? Sure. So I guess just methodologi methodologically, I kind of looked through the provisions and kind of stuck to what was in the provisions to see how designers had constructed these rules to give subnational units a voice. Um, and I kind of pull out five different ways that I think that, that happens. Two of them I think we're pretty familiar with and they're ones that we might expect. So the first is that in the national legislature, there's especially in federal systems, there's often an upper chamber, a senate of some kind that's designed to represent specifically subnational interests and the representatives there are included in the amendment process. So the amendment rules say you know, the, senate, the senate needs to approve these amendments and so theoretically that's a chamber where subnational representation occurs. Um, another related to that and one that we're pretty familiar with is just the idea that proposed amendments need to be ratified by subnational units themselves. So the states in the United States need to ratify proposed amendments from Congress and in Australia a similar sort of process occurs with referenda in the actual states, the Australian states. And those are ones that sort of we were aware of and expected to see. Um, there's, you know, incidentally there's a lot of interesting variation even within those. So there's some unicameral legislatures that are sort of charged with the process of amendment you have within them designated subnational representatives. And so even there, while they're, they're not a majority and so they can't necessarily control the outcome of every single vote, there's a voice for subnational interests even in these unicameral national legislatures. Um, the, the ones that I found sort of particularly interesting and I think are important for people to be aware of from a constitutional design perspective were really those amendment provisions that had created subject matter triggers for subnational involvement. And so th there seems to be, I mean, it's, it's a relatively uh, new trend, but it seems to be that there's a lot of uh, excitement with, amongst constitutional designers when they're faced with subnational groups that want in on this process to say, look, we're not going to have as our default rule that you get to be involved in every single amendment, but let's put into the Constitution and into the amendment process that when we're doing or we're making an amendment that would touch on these certain subjects that might affect you, then you're involved, right? And then that triggers their involvement either through an upper chamber in the national legislature or through direct ratification. Um, and so there's there's lots of interesting variations that are in that um, sort of part of the taxonomy, which I think are are really interesting for designers to be aware of and to think about the variations that they could use to sort of tailor to their circumstances. Um, the, the last two in the taxonomy are just that some constitution or amendment rules allow for initiation by subnational units. Um, it seems to be a, a relatively unpopular sort of method and is not used very effectively uh, very much anywhere actually. Um, and then the last one is in just a couple systems the amendment process triggers a special sort of institution, right? It's convened especially for the amendment process. And the configuration and representation in that special institution does provide for representation of subnational groups. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's kind of the, the overview of the taxonomy um, that I found in the rules. Are there any factors that, uh, that might undermine the effective representation of subnational groups in the amendment process? Yeah, so, you know, especially looking at representation in the, in the national legislature, right? So if that's the primary way that subnational units get voice in this process, um, there's quite a bit of, of empirical research that's been done by others which suggests that in, in countries where there's really strong national political parties, that there's massive agency problems when representatives get to the national legislature. And even if they're in an upper chamber that's meant to represent subnational interests, they often, their voting rep, uh, records often sort of converge on national political party lines and less on interests that should sort of be important to their subnational constituency. And so that's, you know, that, that's a real um, problem. Another issue is just sort of the, the configuration of national legislature. So it's not always constitutionalized. So the seats that subnational groups get in the national legislature are not always guaranteed by the constitution. Often that's sort of delegated to legislation. And so while they do have a voice, you know, there's no guarantee that they, their voice couldn't be cut out at any particular time. So your paper begins um, 
in a way uh, that might suggest that it would unfold differently uh, if we didn't know its title. So the paper begins um, by diving deep into a current U.S. debate about amending the U.S. Constitution, something that many people think is, is impracticable, in fact, impossible today. Uh, but you begin by, by talking about the possibility of a constitutional convention here in the United States. Could you tell us a bit about why you began your paper that way, and if, in fact, it is a real possibility in your view um, that uh, the convention-centric model of amendment could be triggered here in the United States? Uh, sure. I, I don't think it's it's a real possibility. I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's a possibility. Um, you know, the issues really come up because a variety of states have actually petitioned Congress to hold a constitutional convention, and Article 5 gives them that right, and there's some debate about, you know, how Congress is supposed to react. But our general understanding of the convention method is that it was meant to be a way to bypass Congress's ability to put an end or to stop, I guess, amendments that the states might want. And so I don't know that there's much that they could do if, if, if the right number of states had petitioned for the convention. But um, last year, you know, there, uh, Michigan passed or adopted a resolution calling for a convention. And people who have tallied up all the different states that have passed these resolutions came to the conclusion that, hey, we've crossed the threshold, right? Michigan was the state that triggered this. Um, and there's there's a lot of interesting legal issues related to that. Some states have revoked um, their petitions. Some states have made subject matter specific uh, petitions. So they've said, we want a convention, but only to address this particular issue. And so it becomes very difficult to count up all of the different petitions. You know, do we need to cross the threshold for every issue? Do we And we even allow them to make issue-specific uh, requests for a convention. And so it's a very interesting and very timely um, sort of issue. There's lots of concerns, and I think it seems as if there's a great deal of popular support for something like a convention. Um, but there are a lot of, of issues that, are, that would be problematic uh, in terms of actually getting it going. And, and other people have written some great stuff about what would actually happen and what would be at stake if a convention was convened. Yeah, it's a fascinating way to begin this particular paper because you begin with the U.S., but then, but then, as I as I say, you 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 take us on a journey really across the world uh, with multiple experiences uh, across uh, democratic states uh, on on almost every continent. So it's a very rich paper in that in that regard. Uh, so it's interesting to see it begin with the U.S. to concretize the issue, and then to kind of refract outward uh, with other countries. Very very um, interesting paper. Um, one more question, if I could, John. So the paper is about decentralizing the amendment process, uh, decentralizing the way uh, we change constitutions. And I guess I would ask you what your thoughts are on decentralizing the ways we create constitutions. So not decentralization in the amending process, but decentralization in the constitution making process. Should the same calculus figure in our minds in thinking about whether or not to include subnational units in the making of constitutions as they do in the changing of constitutions? Uh, I, you know, that's, it's a really, it's a fascinating question and I think yes. I think that under the right environmental conditions, the constitution making process absolutely needs to look for ways to try to decentralize the process in, in some way. And you know, this is something that I've thought a little bit about in terms of South Africa's experience and, and touched on it a bit earlier. But when you know, that whole constitution-making process is, is going on, you know, it's, it's a nitty-gritty negotiation between the different groups that have a stake in how the new fundamental law is going to going to be. Um, and if, based on the environmental conditions, you know, there are consolidated subnational groups that have a pretty big interest and have a, a lot of support for those collective interests, um, you know, there, there could be a lot said to devising a constitution-making process that allows them to have representation as a group, right? And it could go a long way to promote the legitimacy of the process, which then you would hope would kind of promote the legitimacy of the, the end product, the final document. Um, and there's really interesting, you know, really interesting things, right? So do you, do you take certain issues that might be um, of concern only to some areas and some subnational groups, and do you kind of send those downward so that those are being negotiated during the whole constitution-making process at a subnational level, and then kind of sort of bringing them back up and see how they fit together? 
Um, there, there's all kinds, I think, of interesting ways that the constitution-making process could get divided up. Um, but I, I do think, I guess, some of the same considerations that I'm talking about here in the amendment process could provide a helpful way to think about how that would all unfold. Yeah. And so uh, what's next, uh, Jonathan? What are, you, what are you writing now? So right now I am uh, sort of, I guess, leaving the rest of the world, unfortunately, and I'm coming back to the United States. I'm, I'm looking at the intersection between constitutional change and uh, interpretive methodology. And specifically, I'm looking at what's going on in state constitutional interpretation. And so, for example, in, you know, Alabama's got one of these constitutions in the United States. It's amended a lot, and it's amended frequently. And so I'm trying to probe at whether the flexibility of the document affects judicial decision making. And specifically, I'm looking for indications that the actual interpretive methodology of state judges is in some way informed by the realization that the population could change this document and they do it quite regularly. Um, and so I'm just sort of systematically trying to figure out if there are areas of the law and areas of constitutional doctrine where state judges in state high courts recognize that their document could be changed quickly and allow that to inform how they interpret the text that they actually have in front of them. So I, I'm excited about it. We'll see, see where it goes. Oh, well, that, sounds, that sounds great. Well, we'll maybe have you back on to tell us about that paper when, uh, when it's ready. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.